recording. All right, so please be aware that we are now recording, I think, hopefully. All right, let's get back into it here. Good, thank you for the reminder, Stephen. Okay, so now we have our strategy and investment funding. So we have enterprise executives. We're gonna work with our business owners on the release trains and the enterprise architect will be part of that too. Usually if we have funding that needs to be around non-functional uh, architecture runway um, for one or multiple release trains or solution train, you're gonna need your architect in for that, right? So they're gonna connect the strategy, realize the vision through epics. They're gonna be looking at those funding and what we need to do to align our portfolio overall. I see that recording is running. Yeah, recording, good. Okay, so connecting the portfolio to the enterprise strategic, to strategic themes, because strategic themes are differentiating business objectives, right? These are things that come from your enterprise, like we wanna have higher security, we're looking for more profitability in developing markets, um, we wanna reduce our re reliance on the dollar, unfortunately that might be a goal for some these days, right? So um, these are strategic themes that are gonna come in at the organization level, and then they're gonna get fed into uh, all of our different release trains and our portfolio vision and our lean budgeting, right? So these strategic themes should definitely not be something that's just tech focused. It should be your overall business that you're looking at as a whole uh, when we're looking at strategic themes. Okay, and then describing strategic themes here, we can see we have our objectives and somebody asked a question about this too. So give me a second. I wanna see if I can get that question up. Okay, so the question was, can I use OKRs with SAFE? Okay, so they are here. Did you wanna elaborate on that, uh, Mariana? On your question? No, just that uh, if we really could use OK, uh, OKRs uh, with SAFE, yeah, but it's, you already say yes with this slide. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So but you, if you, you have like any libraries that you can um, share would be very interesting. Yeah. Yes, there, I think there are actually a few uh, articles and links on the safe website. Um, and I can see if I can find those later for you. I should know those, um, but we'll also have it here. So make a note. Um, I can also provide some case studies, Marianne, if you want to catch up offline. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So you can see here some examples. Objective, increase customer engagement in our community platform, reduce membership churn, increase net promoter scores, improve average weekly visits per user, et cetera, right? So these are objectives that are going to be represent our strategic themes and you can quantify them, right? They're, you know, we can say, okay, how do we do against this? We got, you know, traffic up to 3000 users. So we actually have an objective, something we can actually measure um, which is going to help us as well. Lots of organizations now quarterly OKRs and scaled agile implementations. Yep. So this is something that is becoming more popular and taking hold. Stephen, do you want to comment on this? Yeah, I'm seeing a, most clients now are using OKRs that I work with, John. Uh, they they're using they're, and they're using them in this this exactly in this type of um, structure. To be honest. Uh, those absolutely, yeah. So yeah, big big use of OKRs. Okay. Uh, Stephen, I have a question. How do they follow yeah. up? So they're usually quarterly OKRs. So they they set them, and and for in in a and certainly in our safe implementations, mm -hmm. these are um, they're essentially part of the quarterly planning. Now safe calls it program increment planning, PI yes. planning. Yes. Uh, but those OKRs are often set at that PI planning, or if not before, um, and so they are, and then they're reviewed at the end of the quarter, as you would in like a they call them system demos in in Safe, but really it's just a quarterly quarterly review. Did we achieve the objectives that we set out? Did we get the key results that we were looking for? Um, so yeah, um, they're not often not often they're always called OKRs but whether they come as part of a program increment planning or a big room planning, quarterly planning, 
and then how they're reviewed, they might have different names, but essentially they're following the same model that SAFE um, espouses us to use or recommends we use. Okay, so it's uh, usually top down. Uh, largely, um, largely in the cases I've seen, um, not so much top down, they're, they're co-created, um, but, but certainly it's by, it's, it's usually by product management or product owners, along with major business stakeholders. Um, there may well be some inputs and feedback and some innovation from the, the, the teams and the squads. However, yeah. yeah, largely largely set by the business stakeholders and with um, yeah, obviously obvious involvement from product management and product owners. Okay, thank you. Cool. Okay. All right, so strategic themes here, right? So these we talk about being again at the enterprise of the government, the whole organization level, um, a bit of kind of what Stephen's talking about as well. So you're gonna see portfolio vision and we're gonna have our portfolio Kanban that's going to be there. Uh, for all the different initiatives that might go on to release trains later on. And we get our vision for our solution, as well as our, we're going to actually look at our funding and lean budget guardrails. Sorry, guys, this notification thing is really bothering me. Give me one second. I got to just get rid of this app. Hold on. Okay. Got it. All right. Let's try again. Okay, hopefully that will stop dinging every three seconds. Okay, so you can see strategic themes there, right? And that's also gonna feed into our budgets and our lean budget guardrails. And we'll talk about the guardrails coming up in a moment. So let's look at portfolio vision now, right? That's the next thing, maintaining our portfolio vision. Who's seen before the portfolio canvas or the business model canvas? Who's familiar with that? Anybody? Yep, I've played with that. You yes, John. Share what it is. It's like the business case, right? Kind of like the business case, yeah. But I think it's a little more visual. It's a little more visual, because usually a business case might just be kind of written out. Um, but this is a little more kind of, you know, visual representation of how your business works, right? It actually comes from what's called the business model canvas originally. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. something where you can lay out all the different aspects of value stream, your partners and who the initiatives are and what the sources of revenue are, right? Um, cost structure. And this really gives you a broader view instead of just looking at it as, oh, we just have this epic or we just have this, you know, release train we're working with. This actually gives us a picture of what is the business around this whole thing, right? Not, not just kind of a one dimensional view. So that's what this is really about. John, I think, um, is it okay to talk? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, cool. I think, I think you nailed it there. You, you talked about the business, right? So in organizations, that some of them call it a portfolio, but actually organizations have different names for that. It can be a business unit canvas, a line of business canvas. Sometimes um, they have different names for it. So it's, it's often it's, it's usually by business unit or division or line of business, but it is the port. The, it is their portfolio. Um, but you'll often find, certainly when I talk to clients and, and they and we introduce this canvas, it's often they they map it to their lines of business um, or divisions. So yeah, but I think John got it. Um, it's it's the, it's the way their business is structured. That's what makes sense to them. Yeah. All right, welcome, Wayne. Uh, so just one question, sorry. Uh, so like this um, canvas, I have to, to do one for each like business line, but then when I get to like, uh, what's the granularity? Because let's suppose I have epics, so do I have to do like a canvas for each epic or? No. It depends. I think it's more likely you would do one of these like for if you have a major epic, it's going to span uh, release trains or it's going to span, you know, many PIs that that maybe you need funding because there are some epics that are not, you know, they kind of come in more 
how should I put it? You're going to have things, I guess, that might be like more feature level on the release train. They might be not so big. Those you may not necessarily do this for. Oh, I got to mute this. All right, Wayne, I'm going to have to mute you. Hold on, sorry. Okay. So, um, and then also if you have a, you know, like a whole, you know, new value stream that you're evaluating, you're probably going to do a portfolio canvas for that, right? But it's going to be something major. Let's take an example, right? Let's say we're building, um, uh, what do you think up here? We're building computers, right? We're, we're Apple, okay? So I would do a portfolio canvas if I was coming out with a new line of, uh, you know, MacBook Pro, you know, a new line of MacBook Pro computers. I'd probably want a portfolio canvas around, you know, what's the value of it for business, you know, who is going to use it, you know, who are my partners, et cetera, right? But if I was going to just look at, you know, if you guys know the MacBook Pro, they have a little, a little button bar at the top now. It's like a little kind of visual button bar. Um, I don't know if I'd do a whole portfolio canvas around that, right? That's really just a feature, right? So it depends on the size of the thing. Uh, if it's like a whole value stream or if it's something at the portfolio level that's going to be a large, significant epic, yeah. I think it makes sense to do this. But if it's something that's relatively small, maybe it's going to get done in one PI, I don't know necessarily you want to do this. Does that answer your question? Yes. Uh -huh. okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay, so we have SWOT and TOES analysis. In business school, I did lots of SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. TOES is just another way of looking at that, right? So you can look at it and say, well, how is it internal strength, internal weaknesses? and then external opportunities, external threats, and you kind of match them up in kind of a matrix here to figure out, you know, where you are and where your strengths and weaknesses lie. So a few different ways that you can do that. Pretty standard stuff for uh, anybody kind of from the business background, right? And then we can envision the future state of our portfolio. So this is kind of looking at, um, you can think of this like design thinking really, right? Divergent thinking, where we look at different possible portfolio states, and then we come back together and we say, okay, you know what? Now here's the one that we really want to have. And then we break that down into epics, enablers, uh, breaking it down that can go into our release train, right? So we have different portfolio scenarios um, and there's even portfolio scenario analysis. Some tools actually support that. I don't know if Jira does. I think there was one called Agile Craft that might be have used to do this. Um, and then the old version one, CollabNet version one, I think they had this. We can actually evaluate different scenarios uh, in your tooling and kind of see, okay, how much, you know, in a, from a funding perspective, is that going to be, you know, what epics is that going to be? Do we have capacity? So you can kind of model different scenarios and then figure out one you like. Any questions about that? So, so, so where, does, where does financial projections kick in? Is this already, was it already on the canvas or is this mainly content driven scenarios here right now? Yes, it is on the canvas. So if you look on the canvas there, you're going to see that we are going to say, okay, well, what are our key revenue streams? What are our cost structures, right? Who are our key partners? So all of these are going to address the financial aspects of, you know, what's our budget, right? How much is this going to cost us? And we're going to do that analysis with our different, lean, as we call it, port lean portfolio guardrails. So yes, that is part of the portfolio canvas. Okay. So the scenarios will impact that though, right? Um, at least timing of when to spend, when benefits will be harvested, that, that would be a consequence of, of you know, permutations of your, of, your, of your scenario. Yep. So you're going to try multiple different ones, right? And you might say, you know, this fits our budget, this doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we thought this is going to work, but now, you know, we're post-COVID and it doesn't seem to be a good model for us, right? So you are going to make those and take those into account as you, as you look at your scenarios. Oh, all right, cool, thanks. And then we have what we call the postcard for the future here. Uh, so this is kind of our vision as a basis for action. It says, hey, what, uh, you know, what, where do we want to be in the future? This is like when we used to send postcards. I don't know if anybody actually does that anymore. But, um, you know, so you'd go travel somewhere, you'd send a postcard and, you know, say, hey, we're having fun. Here it is. So this is kind of from the future saying, you know, here's where we think our business is going to be. This is the result. This is the outcome. We address things like, how it differentiates us, what future context, what current business context. Uh, this is just kind of a visioning activity to think about a vision for where we think we're going to be uh, and what we think the future will look like potentially uh, for that new portfolio and uh, maybe that new 
uh, portfolio canvas. So establishing lean budgets and guardrails. Here we can see traditionally we funded projects, right? So you had a project, you fund your project, um, you brought a bunch of people together, everybody got in a room and argued about whose project got funded, right? The idea of funding value streams is you're gonna have these lean budgets and they're gonna get applied right to the release trains uh, and the value streams and the release trains are implementing them. So it should be faster. It should be you know, do the kind of quarter by quarter or PI by PI, and you should be able to adapt them really easily where project budgets often are fixed once you set them and it's very hard to change them. So ensuring continued alignment with lean budget guardrails. We can see here, right, here's our guardrails. We have guiding investments by horizon, applying capacity allocation, approving significant initiatives and continuous business owner engagement. So each one of these is a different aspect. This helps us to make sure that we're allocating our budget correctly. Um, so if you think about continuous business owner engagement, for example, you know, a lot of times, especially in my, you know, years in uh, technology, you'll see that we start allocating budgets for projects, maybe the PMO does that, but we don't get a lot of feedback from people who are actually kind of facing the customer in the market as to whether it's valuable what we're doing, whether it's something they want, right? Uh, so continuous business owner engagement, make sure we're getting that perspective. So these four dimensions help us to make sure we have good guardrails around our budget decisions. We'll talk more about these too, okay? So investing by investment horizons. Has anybody ever worked with investment horizons before? Anybody? Anybody know what investment horizons are? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Enlighten us. <laughs> all right, Sebastian, I thought you were going to answer. All right. <laughs> so, all right. So let's take a look here, right? You have your portfolio. And what happens is in that portfolio, we have what we're kind of working on now. You know, this is Horizon Zero. This is stuff that, so for instance, some years ago, I've been in Singapore, it's my eighth year here. But when I was first here, we used to do a lot of scrum training, right? I really don't do a lot of scrum training anymore. Right, that's kind of, you know, been there, done that. It's kind of most teams already know what Scrum is at this point. I mean, I'm sure there's a few that don't, but most do, right? That was Horizon Zero. We're kind of decommissioning that, at least from what I do for my business, okay? Horizon One is more, okay, what are we doing now? So we're doing a lot of scaled agile stuff, right? We're doing a lot around large scale agile and also distributed agile. So we're also looking at a lot of distributed agile, right? Because we have global teams. So we're doing a lot of that kind of work, virtual PI planning, uh, virtual teams, et cetera. That's the topic of my book, et cetera, right? And then we're also starting to look at things that, um, you know, now I'm looking at Horizon 2 and 3, maybe with blockchain. I do a lot of work with blockchain now uh, for the other side of my business as well, but also how we incorporate some of those ideas and concepts that we use there with Agile as well. So I have different horizons and things I focus on and invest in, in my, for my business, for example. Uh, and that's what these horizons are showing us, right? For portfolio, how much of your funds do you allocate for each of these horizons? It may not be exactly the same as, um, you know, what, you know, what you see here, but the majority will probably be for where you're really doing most of the work. So that will be for me, let's say the scaled agile thing work that we do now. And then also a lot, we're starting to do with blockchain and uh, in that space, right? So you need to have a vision for where you're going. If I was still spending all my time on scrum, just, you know, team, single team scrum, how much business do you think there would be for that now? Any guesses? Is there anybody on the call now that exclusively spends their time using Scrum only? So in answer, probably not a lot of business that would be only Scrum, right? At this point, you know, people want to learn about portfolio. They want to learn about large scale agile, distributed agile teams, new innovative technologies, right? Um, but you have to come to a point where you go, you know what? There are some things I'm starting to decommission now. And for me, that would be kind of the individual scrum training type things, right? So is that, that's uh, everybody kind of clear about different horizons. You really need to think about these for your business. 
in your portfolio because you can't be static. For example, the uh, virtual teams and the virtual training, that was not such a big deal for me, you know, two years ago, right? But obviously COVID hit us and now virtual is really essential for my business and I'm sure for yours, right? So you got to look at the future investment horizons. Don't just look at where you are today. John, what kind of um, horizon are we talking about here in terms of concrete time when you see near term and long term? Is this a couple of quarters, um, a couple of years? It depends on your business. Um, but for me, um, I'd say probably kind of that horizon for Scrum was probably a, you know, I guess a two to four year kind of period, followed by another kind of two year period plus on the scaled agile side as we kind of moved into that, then portfolio, uh, more of the distributed stuff on horizon two. So I, I, for me, these are probably, I think maybe a couple, a couple of years in each one, like maybe two years or so um, as I kind of flow through these. Um, and it's nothing static, but that's for me. Yours might be different mm -hmm. in terms of time frames, depending on your business. But it's, it's definitely multi years, right? So this would be the, um, the expectation that the portfolio has visibility in the next two, three, four years, potentially. Yeah. Yeah, you're de I, I would definitely say we're thinking multi-year here. I mean, I, it'd be very short if you were thinking less than a year. I mean, you, you'd have to be in an extremely fast-moving business for that to be possible, I think, right? Mm -hmm. So definitely multi-year, I would say. Okay, any other questions on this one? Our recording is still looking good. Yeah. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so establishing portfolio flow. So traditionally, we have unlimited work intake. I'm sure many of you have been in traditional projects. I think, Stephen, you still do some traditional, traditional ones, right? People come in, they go, hey, there's more work, there's more work. And people just take the work. Like, hey, more work. They just take the work, right? Just keep taking work, keep taking work. And then, you know, it's time to release. We're like 18 months in. They're like, oh, we can't make it. Oh, no, we have too much. Well, we can't finish. We got to move the date, right? That's tradition. In an Agile, in a Lean portfolio management, we're going to match demand of capacity. We're going to say, okay. We have this much in our epics and our backlog, portfolio backlog, uh, and our portfolio Kanban. We're going to match that with the budgets. We're going to put it on the release trains, and we're going to have the teams plan and their PI planning and determine how much they can work on and take on, right? So they're matching their capacity to what we have in our portfolio, uh, and then they're giving us feedback as to when they complete it, kind of that lean portfolio cycle, right, uh, or lean startup cycle. So very different from unlimited work intake, which almost always ends up in everything going, just blowing up. Right. So I'm sure many of you have been on projects that have blown up like that because people kept taking work, taking work, and it seems like no big deal, but then you get 12 months down the road and you can't deliver, right? So that's a big difference. And then governing Epic Flow with the Epic Portfolio Kanban. So again, we're at the top of the scaled agile big picture, right? Right at the top there. And we've got this Kanban. We're reviewing, we're analyzing, going to portfolio backlog. Now when we get to the part where it says implementing, when we get to the part where it says implementing, this is going to go down to the release train, right? So we go down onto the release train and they're going to implement it. They're going to give us feedback and we're going to come back and decide whether we're going to implement more, or whether we're going to stop. We call that pivot or persevere. And then we take it through the done back in our portfolio level, right? So we're constantly moving through the portfolio. We are making different decisions about whether we're going to, you know, fund something, uh, add it to a, one of our release trains or our value streams. We're implementing it. And this is what we call the lean startup cycle as well, because we're constantly evaluating these things as they go through our portfolio Kanban uh, and seeing if we want to keep doing more, or if we want to stop, right? So I've invested quite a bit myself in our business in terms of virtual training, right? And uh, that seems to be a good idea to keep investing because I don't think we're doing any classroom training anytime soon. Um, so, you know, that's kind of something that I've been kind of putting onto our, the value streams that we're working on. I also do some fintech stuff for developing markets, and we're doing a lot more on that as far as blockchain, and so spending some time on that. And so I'm going through, and those are things that are on the value streams that I'm working on. So this would be just to be clear, this would be on a level. If you're saying it's on an epic level, so basically a bunch of epics would be a consequence of one um, of one lean canvas. Yeah, or, or how do we how do I have to visualize that? Yes, that's right. You probably are going to have multiple epics to implement the kind of the one lean portfolio, lean portfolio canvas, um, mm -hmm. because that's really, I mean, think about, I like to use the example of Facebook, right? 
know when Mark Zuckerberg was back in his dorm room, not now, but back when he's back in his dorm room, all right, Facebook was just like, you know, a little app to, you know, like match people on campus and I guess share gossip or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And that was basically all it was. So there wasn't really a very big portfolio canvas around it. But as he started to scale it up into the business that takes all of our information today, <laughs> right? He had to get a big portfolio canvas as to who's my customer, who am I selling to? Who am I buying from? What's my ecosystem? What, you know, and there's many different efforts. They got the Facebook Messenger, they got the WhatsApp stuff, they got the, you know, the it's not touch Cambridge Analytica, but you get the idea, right? There's <laughs> there's a lot of different stuff going on for right. Facebook, right? So that portfolio canvas is gonna have a lot of different efforts, right? Mm-hmm. Well, cool. John, could I could I, if I could, um that's yeah. um Sebastian, so those blue blue tickets there, they are epics, and the red are more like enablers, which could be a system, it could be tech, it could be anything. The the really interesting thing about the portfolio countdown is it's it's quite intuitive actually. It's it, you, and you could certainly have um, you could certainly those epics could be delivered um, with waterfall with traditional approach. That's that's not a problem. The really interesting thing is those number threes that um, are just above reviewing and analyzing because what the flow is trying, what you'll do with flow is you will limit the work in progress. So you'll see that there are only three tickets in the reviewing column. That's because we'll limit the work in progress to make sure we get more effective flow of the epics. And instead of, as John was talking about before, you're taking on lots and lots of epics at the same time and effectively not getting anything done because you you get the whole system gets clogged up and you get a lack of flow. Um, so those numbers three above are actually really important. They're they're about limiting work in progress in this one step and achieving better flow of epics through that Kanban. Yeah, that's a great. Point. Sorry, John. Now that's a great point actually. So those those are whip limits um, for those of you guys familiar with those and that does constrain the flow. That really is really important. Otherwise, like Stephen said, you just end up getting blocked up. It's because the only difference between what we're doing here in a traditional project is that we are maintaining the flow, right? Of what's going through. Traditional project, we just put everything in and then go, oh, you can't make the date? What's wrong, right? So that, that's the difference here, right? Like the, basically the, the work and process limit for traditional projects is infinity. Just keep putting stuff in there, right? Where here, we actually do limit it. That's a great point. Do you have another question with it? At what point would you discard an epic if it's let gets rejected? It's not going to happen. What the yeah, after that cycle here? You don't, you really don't see it, but there's a cycle here. I don't know if we have it later on. And basically, mm-hmm. this is going on to the release train. This part here. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when it's going on to the release train, we might go and we implement it. We're like, you know, we're doing some new blockchain stuff. Oh, this is really good. Or we're doing some new stuff for remote classes, um, working really well. But then we realize, wow, you know, um, it doesn't make any sense to keep investing in that. And at one point, you know, we're gonna maybe get some feedback from one of our demos, our system demos at the end of a PI. Maybe our business owners say, you know what, we're not getting any more value from this. I think that's enough, right? And at that point, we might say, okay, you know what, let's stop. Let's mm-hmm. not invest the next PI. Let's plan something different, right? Let's bring another epic in. So at that point is where we would then. So this is where it's really going on to the release train and where we're making those decisions based on actually implementing in our MVP, our minimum viable product. Right, and it gets pulled from the portfolio backlog. So it, it might all end up in the backlog, but it might be sitting at the bottom and might never get pulled in, into a PI That's plan. That's possible. Um, which hopefully, if it doesn't get pulled, then you probably just get it done because you decided it wasn't high value, but yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, cool, thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. All right, so it's our portfolio Kanban. We get another level of detail view here. So we can see the funnel. Every idea can come in at the top of the funnel. We're going to do our hypothesis statement for our epics here. We're going to analyze it. That's our portfolio. They're kind of looking at, you know, maybe a lightweight business case. And then we're going to put it in the backlog. And then we're going, this is the cycle I wanted to show you there, uh, the question you just had, Sebastian. The uh, lean startup cycle. This is where it goes onto the release train. They implement it, decide do we want to do more, do we want to stop? If they want to do more, they keep on implementing and putting more features and breaking that down, uh, that epic on the release train. Or if there's no more, then they're gonna stop. And they're gonna say, you know what? Is it we're gonna pivot? No, then we just stop the whole thing. Or maybe we wanna make an adjustment, then we come back and we try adding some more different epics and we go back and bring more things in, okay? So this is the lean startup cycle. Welcome, son. Okay, so this is the lean startup cycle. 
if you guys have never read the book Lean Startup by Eric Rice, I highly recommend that, or at least check out the website and the videos. Okay. All right, and this is even closer on that Lean Startup cycle. So again, we got things coming out of our portfolio. We're evaluating a minimum viable product on them. We're saying, hey, hypothesis, you know, are we going to get more customers by doing remote classes? Yeah, probably the answer is yes to that, right? So, okay, let's go in, let's implement some tools. Let's implement, you know, some platforms, some marketing to do more remote classes. You know, our more PI planning remotely, whatever it is, we're getting value. And as long as we're getting more value, we're going to keep on putting in more features uh, from the epics. We're going to keep putting those in on the on the release train. And then when we're done, we're going to say, okay, you know what? Um, maybe that hypothesis is not working, or we're that's it for that. Then we even decide to pivot, which means we go back and try a different hypothesis and different epic. Or we say no, you know, we're going to just stop on that epic and we're done with that one. So this is this lean startup cycle called build, measure, learn. Anybody seen that or heard that before? Build, measure, learn? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is how we implement that cycle in Scaled Agile. And it's very valuable because what it does, it avoids you making a really big investment on something that maybe just isn't gonna work, right? So, and I try to keep this in mind as I'm you know, an entrepreneur, as I'm doing everything else I do as well. You want to make small investments and then see, okay, you know, did this work or not? And have no problem. They say be, you know, be merciless in terms of pivoting or persevering. So if you need to change, go ahead and change. Don't be like, no, no, we've already implemented three of these. We got to keep going. Stop. If it's not working, do something different, right? All right. And that is definitely really at the heart of agility. Support agile portfolio operations. Agile portfolio operation, you can see here, we've got our release train engineer and scrum masters, media practice, and then we have our agile PMO and mean agile center of excellence, right? Coordinating value streams, supporting program execution and fostering operational excellence. And we can see here, they're coordinating across the value stream. They're looking at as work goes through the different PIs, they're coordinating roles, introducing new work into the portfolio, making sure kind of aligning on the cadence, which is always the same. Everybody's on the same um, cadence for all the teams on the release train, right? And synchronizing with each one of our PIs at the end of the PIs. And then they're also introducing more work in the portfolio and making sure everything gets integrated and they're evaluating, hey, did we get you know, everything that we committed to and releasing on demand, right? And releasing on demand is important because releasing on demand means that when the, when the market needs it, the market gets it versus what I like to call the tail wagging the dog. We're like, no, no, we got to wait on, you know, the technology. We're still doing some technology stuff right now. You want to make sure that the market is driving what gets released, not, you know, oh, you know, we have a new, no new DevOps tool. And the new DevOps tool is determining what we release. Make sure the market gets released on demand. Okay. The supporting program execution, right? We got our Agile PMO, which supports program execution works with the Lean Agile Center of Excellence, foster decentralized PI planning because we want each team to be involved in each release train to be involved in their own planning. You shouldn't have any, oh, the centralized you know, PMO is doing all the planning. Don't do that. So a story from back in my early days of Agile, right? I was in a PMO. I hadn't been doing a lot of PMO work. I've been an architect, but I was in a PMO at that time. And I was tasked to work with an Agile team. So I went to work with this Agile team and, you know, I did most of the planning with a few key people, right? Some architects, some key leaders, and almost had a mutiny because the whole team was so mad. They're like, why are you not involving us? Why aren't we planning this? And of course, this is something I didn't get back then. I was like, oh, well, you know, we did the planning, you know, that's what the PMO does. Um, don't do that, right? Everybody in your team should be involved in the planning. That's why we do PI planning. That's why we bring everybody together. And as we say in Azure, the people who do the work should plan the work, right? So make sure that everybody is there. Also more on agile contracts, lean budgets, and facilitating the portfolio sync also. Okay, so these are all things that our agile PMO can be helping with. Just make sure you don't make yourself a bottleneck trying to do all the planning. You should facilitate and help the teams, but don't try to do it all yourself, okay? Okay, just, just one question. question. Uh, in case uh, you have uh, waterfall projects also in your, your organization, right? You have Agile, but also waterfall for uh, more simple projects, let's suppose. Uh, so how can you align that? 
with the yeah. with the agile PMO. Yep, that's okay. a good question. So there are some ways that we can do that. Um, give me a second here. Hold on, pull up the big picture. Hopefully. All right. Can you guys see the big picture there? Uh, yep. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a million other tabs. So what you see is that you see that supplier there. In fact, let's go to full. The supplier, this you can think of as like a non agile team. So you have a couple of release trains that are working along the same PI, right? And they have the same kind of schedule of synchronization. Uh, but the supplier is not agile, right? So maybe they're making like air, airplane engines in your case, Fabrice, right? And maybe they're not, they're not, you know, they're separate companies, Rolls Royce or something. They make the engines. So what you do is you have, they, they might sync up with you and the agile teams at certain points, like at the PIs, right? Beginning end of PI. But they are not actually running in an agile way. So if you click into this, it actually gives you a lot more information about, and this is a good way I like to work, right? So this gives information about suppliers. Um, this actually will tell you, okay, well, how do we align with them? You know, there's certain points of the PI, beginning and end of the PI. Uh, if we have solution trains, we actually have these solution train demos, uh, et cetera, that they can do as well. Um, and then we can have them come at those points and involve to kind of align their milestones with what we're going to do, but they're not necessarily an agile team. So this is a good approach. And I would, I would click and check into that if you're interested in how you can work with non-agile and agile teams. Okay, I got it. Okay, it, it's more like uh, um, aligning the milestones and bringing them together in certain points, right? Okay. Yeah. So, and they should definitely not hinder your your scaled agile team. They should align with the PI, you know, and the synchronization of your, your uh, scaled agile teams. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I like the idea to use the portfolio Kanban uh, independently of the delivery model. Uh, so if you if you decide that an epic needs to happen, then it doesn't matter if it's executed agile or if it's executed waterfall. It's just that if it's waterfall, it's probably a bit more black boxy. Or if it's an agile, then you would it would show up in, in a PI somewhere. But I think that that precursor process is still applicable quite nicely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean that realistically is going to happen because a lot of organizations, especially if you have a big program or something that's spanning different organizations or vendors, you're, you're probably going to have some parts of that that may not be agile. Uh, so this definitely does come up. Okay. All right. So here's fostering organization operational excellence as well. The Lean Agile Center of Excellence, small team of people dedicated to implementing SAFE, right? So communicate to the business the need for SAFE, integrate SAFE practices and fostering communities of practice, um, which are really important in organizations to kind of uh, improve your overall uh, use of agile and scaled agile creating alignment and providing coaching to the arts. This means that you would have to have agile coaches uh, in the arts or SPCs in the arts from the skilled agile perspective, right? So you need somebody who understands SAFE. Um, I think Stephen, you work with some PMOs, not sure if there's anything you wanna add on that early in Agile Centers of Excellence. No, John, I'm, I'm seeing the, I'm actually seeing more organizations split the two. So. They might not call them a center of excellence. They have different names. I've got one client who calls it a group digital office, actually, believe it or not, um, which, yeah, but it's there effectively, they have this center of excellence within. Um, mm -hmm. The PMO is still there. I mean, or, most organizations have retained their PMOs, and, mm -hmm. um, but they're, I find more and more we're splitting these two ways, you know, excellence yep. around agile and the, yep. the craft of, of agile and then, PMO for the management of your portfolio, right? Yeah. And I think it's actually very key to work with whatever PMO there is uh, and to get them on your side, so to speak, right? You really want them to be supporting what you're doing with your scaled agile uh, implementation uh, and you don't want them to be a bottleneck or in the way, right? So that, that's important, I think. Okay. All right, so applying lean governance. Here we have our enterprise architect, our PMO, Agile PMO, Lean Agile Center of Excellence, our business owners, right? They're forecasting and budgeting dynamically, measuring portfolio performance, coordinating continuous compliance. And we can see 
Traditionally, we do the big upfront annual planning, which is very rigid budget cycles. If you need to adapt somewhere in the middle, it's a big change request process, very painful, very difficult. And in Scaled Agile, we use a rolling wave planning. So every PI, um, we're going through, we're allocating and adjusting budgets as we need to. We're doing portfolio syncs each month there, as you can see. And we're kind of going through and adjusting budgets as we need to dynamically to ensure. Um, and we go through and adjust our budgets dynamically to ensure that everybody gets um, what they need to implement the upcoming objects. So you can see this is a participatory budgeting and most organizations generate more good ideas here. Uh, and this could happen each month or at a period that makes sense for you and your organization. And the participants are gonna be from different value streams and they're gonna collaboratively establish what budgets we need to have to keep our value streams or restraints going. Stephen, did you? I think you had a comment on this earlier. Did you want to add anything on participatory budgeting? Participatory budgeting. I've got a couple of clients who are talking about it, John, um, but they're not yet. They've not really yet pulled that together. Where you've got different people from effectively different business units coming together, and then in a session like just like that, actually resetting their budgets. I think that most organizations have still got that annual budgeting and they've yet to kick into either half half year or even even quarterly adjustments to that. So I've got but I've got a couple of clients who are pushing towards this actually. They're getting they're quite close to getting to that point. Yeah. Yeah, and I think this is something that may be new for a lot of organizations as they move into an agile way of working. Um but it is something that more organizations are trying to, you know, start to incorporate, which is good. So it's good that you're seeing that, Stephen. More organizations trying to do this. Okay. So these meetings are mm -hmm. quarterly, monthly. Or... Well, what do you say? Uh, this value stream budget uh, meetings, right, uh, where you get the team and do all mm -hmm. the the value stream. Yep. Uh, so this is normally held uh, quarterly or, or monthly. Sorry, I got a lot of background noise, Mariana. <laughs> You're I'm sorry, my kids, my kids are here. <laughs> I try okay. to mute when they no uh, when they start uh, talking with each other. Sorry, but no um, this this meeting are normally quarterly or monthly meetings. D did you ever see like monthly meetings for value stream? budget or this is too so much if you saw previously they kind of they kind of hint at this being like a monthly kind of portfolio sync um frankly honestly I've, I've never seen anything that frequent i don't know Stephen, if you have but i haven't no, no as i'm saying uh, clients are still setting their budgets for this for the value stream work annually although i I'm getting to the point where clients are realizing they need to do it more frequently. So we're talking about half yearly, which is actually what SAFE recommend, um, but you might even take it to quarterly and adjust it just ahead of your PI planning. But we'll, you know, as John said, we're, we're not seeing that yet, but they are talking about it, which will give them the ability to, to, be, to give a, a higher level agility, Marianne, so they can then, switch funding to different um, uh, release trains. Um, so, but I think, um, I think Grab actually do it, John. They, they do it. They've got, they've got an interesting model. Um, hmm. I've not been personally involved, but they, they, they adjust the, the budgeting, but they, they do it in a, they don't do it through participatory budgeting. They, they swap resources at the moment. So it's, it's, it's quite light touch. But that, that's the closest I've seen. And I think that quarterly cadence is, is pretty ideal in my mind, Mariana. Um, I think when it starts getting more frequent than that, we're going to see later on if we get a chance to be on budgeting. Um, that quarterly is a good frequency. I think monthly might be a bit much, frankly. I don't know if everybody wants to get together every month to discuss the budget. <laughs> but yeah, quarterly, maybe that's half yearly. Really <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Yep. All right, so overview of participatory budgeting events. Safe participatory budgeting, we can see kind of how it's laid out, right? Prepare the content, get everything ready uh, from our epics, from our portfolio epics and uh, solution, and then assemble the participants, our business owners, 
Epic owners, solution architects, we're going to conduct our forums and then analyze the results, right? And look at how we want to allocate these budgets across our different value streams and our different release trains. And we can see after the budgeting event, right? So you can see we had 28 million total and we made some adjustments. We had 10 million going to one release train, another 18 million going to another one. And then we allocated a little more uh, to the first release train and a little less to the second two. So you make some adjustments as you go. And that can happen, like we said, quarterly. PI is basically aligned to a quarter, uh, which is why I think that's a pretty good period to use uh, for this. Okay. Okay, next steps. So safely in portfolio management is a two-day interactive course and a one-day starting with LPM workshop. Uh, it's part of that as well. And you can gain practical tools and techniques uh, for that. So we kind of covered a little bit of uh, intro to it, but it's a lot more interactive, including the workshop. And then also we explored a lean portfolio management adoption roadmap, which you can see in the bottom right corner there and practice those activities for your business context and build your own plan for lean portfolio management. And of course we have a class coming up, Nidhi's not on tonight, but myself and Nidhi have a class along Sharish um, from Plank Era uh, coming up later this month on the 23rd. Uh, so if you're interested in that, there'll be links for it on the Eventbrite. Uh, and we'll have that for you available to follow up later as well. You can also ping Sharish in the comments if you want to in the chat box. Okay, so we have that class coming up on the 23rd, which is um, online. It's actually going to end up being, I believe, four days. So there's three, uh, and then the final one is the workshop uh, where we do the Lean Portfolio Management Workshop Day. Okay, Sharish, anything you want to add on that? Just one question. Um, is there any examination to do after the, the classes? Yes. yes. Okay. For the certification, there is. I mean, you have a certificate of completion, right? You can take home your, you know, you can take your plan with you. But when you want the certification of the LPM, uh, you need to complete uh -huh. the safe exam, which is 30 days after the class. You have to complete it online. And is it sufficient the the classes, or I need to study more uh, with with uh, myself? You get a learning plan. So the learning plan is in the Safe Community platform. When you log in, when you finish the class, you get an email, and that will tell you all the lessons to go through. It will give you like a okay. review and then a practice exam. And once you complete that, then you are uh, ready to take the exam. So. Once you've done a learning plan and once you have completed that and you're passing pretty well the practice exam, you should be all good to go, ready to go. Okay. Thank you. All right, so more information about that available as well in uh, the Eventbrite site. You'll see it in the invite as well. We'll provide that after the next session as well. Okay, so Agile Finance. Let's go into that a little bit now. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about mindset in budgeting, and uh, we'll look at beyond budgeting, the business ecosystem of finance, and a little bit about accounting and capex opex. So this is a session we did for the business agility group. Um, I think last year did we do this? I don't remember now. So last year was such a time warp. Anyway, uh, we did a while ago. We're going to go through and cover some of these topics, right? So we've already covered from Safe how we do the allocation across release trains. You guys have already seen that. Right, and some challenges in traditional finance, the annual budget cycle can be too slow. Quarterly steering is often better, or even twice yearly, as Stephen talked about, could be good, right? So this is beyond budgeting. There are different principles. I don't think the video is actually in there, but anyway, this is uh, one of the founders of beyond budgeting. This is focused completely on agile budgeting, right? And you can see the principles here. Right, so leadership principles, engage, inspire people, bold and noble values govern through shared values, not through detailed rules or regulations, right? Targets, number eight there, sets rational and ambitious relative goals, avoid and cascaded targets. Number 12, awards, awards shared success against competition, not against fixed performance and contracts, right? So this is beyond budgeting. This is not from Scaled Agile, but this is a way that you would be able to use Agile in your finance function in an organization. So this is really focused not on, in fact, this I think came, would evolve separately from Agile, um, but then they found that they really had so much alignment with you know, kind of Agile that really was kind of a business agility approach uh, and they kind of embraced that. But uh, this is beyond budgeting. Anybody ever heard of beyond budgeting before? 
Yes. <clears throat> yep. Never used though. Oh, you use it? Uh, I've never used it though. So I've just oh, never used it. Okay. It. Has anybody ever used it in their organization? No, not used. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so some of the budget problems, often a weak link to strategy, which is very true, right? You put money into projects, but it's not really tied to it, very time consuming. Uh, that budgeting process and it's going through that can be very, a lot of your time, decisions are made too early and too high up. You can see some of the rest there, right? The according forecasting horizons, you're always either forecasting or checking results or forecasting um, and often a bad yardstick for evaluating performance. So they say it's irritating issues or symptoms of a bigger problem, right? The world has changed. Traditional theory X, anybody ever heard of theory X and theory Y management? Uh, yes. Yep. Yes, yes, yes. That is? McGregor. Go ahead. McGregor theory. Yeah. <clears throat> and what's the idea behind that? Ah, uh, it's about management culture. Uh, theory X says uh, you, people are not very proactive. You need to push them uh, to uh, even punish them <laughs> if you want them to work. And theory Y says, no, people are creative. If you give them uh, the space uh, uh, they need to work, they will work and prove that they can do the job uh, in an autonomous way. Exactly. So theory X really says, you know what, you got to watch people all the time. If you don't watch them, they're going to do something. They're going to try to get away with something. They're lazy, right? You know, make sure you're watching every minute. Now, COVID has really changed this a lot because a lot of managers that any managers I've known, they made their career on watching people all the time. And you really can't do that anymore, right? If you're all virtual, you can't sit and watch someone in their house all day, right? At least I hope not. <laughs> so this theory X is getting a little hard to implement anymore, right? Theory Y says you trust people, they're going to do their best, they want the opportunity to do well, you know, they're looking for that opportunity, all you have to do is provide them with the environment to do it, right? So as you can see here, beyond budgeting is really based on the idea of theory Y leadership, not theory X rigid rules-based micromanagement, right? So the idea is dynamic, it's theory Y, um, right? So no traditional budgeting, relative directional goals, dynamic planning and forecasting for resource allocation, holistic performance evaluation, right? And this is the idea behind Beyond Budgeting. So again, you can see aligns very good with the, um, aligns very well with agile principles and ideas. So we can see here, this came from Bjart Bogsnes. I don't know if I said it correctly. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong there in the pronunciation, right? And he did this at StatOil, which is a company where they used it for their budgeting. They set targets forecast and resource allocations, uh, which each one of these had different right functions. A target is for inspiring and motivating. A forecast is unbiased. It's what the expected outcome is, unvarnished. And then you got resource allocation, it's dynamic, no annual allocation. Um, it's basically just, you know, how are we going to, you know, what people and resources do we have available to be able to achieve our goal? And these are different numbers. Some organizations try to use these as the same number. A target and a forecast are definitely not the same thing, right? You can have a target, but your forecast is like, this is what's definitely going to happen, even though our target might be, you know, to make it to the moon, to the stars, but, you know, the forecast is we're actually going to hit the moon, right? And then this is one of the, I think, like the eight ports they used to use uh, to basically talk about where they're going, right? Strategic objectives, how to measure progress and key performance indicators, and then how we're gonna get there, which is the details of it, right? So this will take us through those specifics for this particular organization, I think it's from StatOil as well. And this is a CEO on ambition to action, right? So he talks about, we had a management model, which is very well suited to dealing with turbulence, rapid change, it enables us to act and reprioritize quickly so we can fend off threats or seize opportunities. This is much more difficult than the traditional budget world, right? One of the main principles in the ambition action concept is that stat oil consists of mature, professional, able people who both can, can and want to accept responsibility. So that's theory Y management. If you think theory X management, right? 
which is I have to watch you all the time. You're trying to cheat me. I got to make sure that, you know, we, we were very rigid and we make sure you're not doing the wrong thing. Um, this is not going to work, right? So you can see those are really agile principles. In agile, you know, that we have the idea that basically it's theory why, that people are trying to do their best, they want to do well, give them the environment that they'll thrive, right? Okay, let's talk about also a little bit of the business ecosystem here around finance. Uh, I actually did a course uh, for some years ago for IC Agile on Agile finance, actually. So we covered some of these, uh, but this comes from Scaled Agile, this particular chart. You can see there's firm fixed price contracts that you might do. Uh, these are very hard with Agile, right? Because anybody have an idea why it's hard to do a firm fixed price contract with Agile implementation? And you don't want to fix the scope. Yeah, you don't want to fix the scope. So it's very hard, right? The contract says one thing, but then you're trying to be flexible with your backlogs, adjust your PI planning, and those two are not going to agree, right? That's, that's not going to work. And then on the other side, you have time and materials. Time and materials, um, right? That's just like, hey, no, there's no specification at all, really. Just give me some hours. Let's see what we get done. And obviously, if you're the vendor, that's great because you just keep doing the work. But if you're the client, you're going to be pretty upset because, you know, you're like, when, when are you going to get done with this? You just keep putting in more, more hours, you know. So usually there are some others that are a balance of these, like cost plus, target price, that actually an iterative incremental, which is what I really like, where you kind of have maybe you, you know, if you're working with somebody who's your client or something, maybe you do it by the iteration or by the PI, uh, and you price that into your contract instead of having a firm fixed price or pure time materials, which are more traditional, okay? So the way that you set up your contract will set you up for success in the way you're able to budget and run your, uh, your scaled agile implementations and your agile budgeting and finance. Uh, but if you set like a pure fixed price, it's gonna be really difficult. Any questions on this? That's good, thanks. And then this is actually a video we have on CapEx versus OpEx. It's one of the uh, video blogs I do on suspiciousagile.com. Um, but basically the idea here is that CapEx and OpEx with concepts of traditional projects, right? You have your capital expenditure, which is where you're putting out new development, new architecture, et cetera. OpEx, you're doing maintenance type work. Um, but it's a little harder to track that when you're using a uh, agile approach or scaled agile approach. Some good articles on this as well. Um, you can also find the blog. Um, that I've done on this. And what you'll see is that basically from Agile, but you can kind of divide up in your backlog and say, okay, well, you know, maybe some of the enablers, those are probably going to be OpEx type spending. Um, and then maybe some of the functionality is more CapEx as you're building. Um, and there are different ways you can divide up your backlog to determine, you know, for traditional accounting in your organization, what is CapEx and what is OpEx. And it's really important to do this. I can actually share some videos that I've done on this if you're interested in this topic. Um, it's really key to be able to do this because if you can't, it's very hard, like let's say Fabrice, you're in your situation where you're working with traditional um, kind of portfolio management, traditional budgeting, um, they're going to want answers to what is CapEx, what is OpEx, and you need to be able to provide those answers. Okay. Any questions on that? Uh, just one, one question. Mm -hmm. uh, so whenever I have like an epic and this epic is finished and give give value to the company, then mm -hmm. I can uh, take them off capex and bring to opex, right? Or depends There's on a, the strategy or it depends, right? I think that one of the ways that we'll see is that the functionality, anything that's functionality, um, is basically considered to be you know, CapEx expenditures, we're building in the PI functionality. And then if we start operating or we have something that's already maybe deployed uh, and that's running, that those might be OpEx expenditures. So like our system team uh, supporting anything that's already live or sometimes the enablers, the red ones in the picture, right? Those enablers, um, those may be more not functionality. Maybe they're not new, you know, things that we're building per se. And maybe those might be OpEx. There are a few videos, and I can share those at the end, that walk through some different strategies as to how you can divide up from an agile perspective, what is CapEx and what is OpEx. So. Okay, thank you. Okay. 
I guess, in some ways, a little bit more of an art than a science because capex and opex actually come from traditional project uh, accounting. But you do that, you do the tracking. Because the, the accounting is traditional. And yeah, then. That's right. yeah. What were you saying, Sebastian? Oh, I was just curious. So you would, you would track that on an epic level, is it? OPEX and CAPEX in terms of forecasting, in terms of actuals? Or possibly. Uh, possibly, but you may also do it at a feature and a release train level. All right. So let's okay. say you're tracking CAPEX and OPEX on the release train. That would more likely be features, I would think, because the features is what you're going to have on your release train. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Features and enablers, actually. Any other questions on this? Okay, so contact info for me, you can find me there um, on LinkedIn and YouTube. And of course, at uh, my email contact, you can also find the class there at speciesagile.com. Um, and the videos are on YouTube. So if you just go to look for me, John O'Cora on YouTube and look for CapEx OpEx, you'll actually find the videos on that topic for Agile. Um, there's one for Agile budgeting, there's one for uh, CapEx and OpEx and Scaled Agile. Um, and I think we also have budgeting at Scaled Agile and Agile Contracts. So you'll find all those video blogs there available for you also. Okay, so let's see what questions you guys have. We're down through, we've gone through finance, we've gone through portfolio. Um, obviously the class is coming up. You can find that on Scaled Agile, auspiciousagile.com uh, as well. And any questions that you guys have uh, for me or just generally uh, on the topics we covered today or anything else for upcoming meetups? Yeah, John, you mentioned at the beginning um, metrics and KPIs. Could, mm -hmm. you, could you speak to this a little? Yep. Uh, so Scaled Agile gives us multiple dimension, dimensions of... Let me switch this over. I'm going to pull this up and put it on screen. So if you go into the big picture here... Mm -hmm. There we go. If you go into the big picture, you're gonna see, it's not the big picture, where did you go? a lot of tabs there. <laughs> yeah, I always have a lot of tabs, don't worry about that. But anyway, <laughs> this should be the right one. Okay, so, if you look at the top of the big picture, you're gonna see measure and grow up here, see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we click into that, and I've used these a lot. Uh, they have different assessments that you can use. So this looks crazy, but, basically across seven the seven competencies and the three uh, dimensions of each competency. So we have continuous learning, innovation, culture, and learning. So you can actually download these to self-assessments. They basically go in Excel, your spreadsheet, and you're, it'll create this kind of uh, this chart for you. And I like to do guided self-assessments with teams as we go through our implementation of SAFE or Agile. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason I do guided self-assessment is what you don't want to happen is you don't want people to think number one, you're just assessing them because then they ignore it. They're like, yeah, forget it. You know, you're just telling us we don't know agile. They don't listen. But if you kind of guide them and go, okay, well, what do you think? How do you think you guys are doing on the leadership side? How do you think your mindset is agile mindset, learning culture? And they go, oh, we think it's this. And you talk them through it, then you fill it out. Then they really evaluate themselves. And that is what they pay a lot more attention to that because they're using their own input and their own feedback, right? Mm -hmm. So these are really great. You have one at the business agility, all the competencies. Uh, there's another one, team and technical agility. Uh, there's quite a few, actually. And then we also have some for, I think, the, the team level agile and kind of release train program level agile as well. So you can just go over here and download these under measure and grow, and they'll give you all the questions. Uh, if I have one. Anyway, they'll give you all the questions that you need to be able to uh, run these assessments and then be able to get kind of like this output for uh, your team. Mm -hmm. Okay, very cool. Thanks. Okay, other questions? All right. Other questions? No, John, thank you very much. Uh, John, Jonathan here. So, just a question for you. Yep, go ahead. Um, so, is it just a generic question from my side uh, to understand. Um, let's say, like, for example, a company that was doing a traditional uh, project and portfolio management. At mm -hmm. what point uh, would they know kind of uh, should they decide whether they want to go into agile? I mean, 
they're doing let's assume they're doing well will mm-hmm. there be a case for them to kind of switch to a, uh, an agile way or i mean what what point does a company decide you know you're saying what, what point well, do they go to a to a agile portfolio to a, yeah that's right because they're doing well they're using traditional uh, project and portfolio management right but do they should they take up agile or should they just live with what they're currently doing or you know it depends. I mean, if you're seeing a lot of conflicts between the portfolio management and the agile teams, hmm. that would be a key indicator that you should move to agile portfolio management. So let's say, you know, your PMO is like, hey, what percent complete are you? How have you hit your milestone, right? And everything is very fixed, traditional. Yeah. The agile teams are saying, well, no, we got to change our backlog every PI. You know, we need to adjust every iteration. And the PMO and the agile project and the port- governance is saying, no, you can't do that. That's a really good indicator. You should probably start moving to an agile portfolio, right? Because it's it's hindering your project teams. Right, right. Yeah. Now, if you have none of that kind of conflict, let's say you got a very flexible PMO and they're like, hey, no problem. Go ahead, make the adjustments you need to. Um, then great, that's no problem. You should go ahead and you can probably stick with what you're doing for now, uh, especially when you only have maybe a few single team level agile teams. But as you start to scale up and move to scaled agile, I think, and in fact, it's in the roadmap here. I want to let me see if I can show this to you. Sure. Give me a second. Okay. So in the roadmap here, so there's our big picture again. All right. So if you go to the implementation roadmap, hmm. you're going to see at first you maybe set up your Lean Agile Center of Excellence. Right. All right. You set up your Lean Agile Center of Excellence. You start kicking off release trains. But later on, they really say, okay, extend your portfolio, right? So it's not the first thing you do usually. Most organizations don't start by doing portfolio, right? Right, right. But after a while, you know, it starts getting a little awkward. It starts constraining them that they don't have Azure portfolio. And that's when they start to add it on, right? Maybe you got a few release trains. You got multiple Agile teams and you really want to be able to adapt to that. That's when you're going to start running portfolio. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I'm short, right? And another question for you. Sorry if it's okay if I have another no, no question. No problem, go ahead. Uh, so how does one, you know, kind of um, um, understand the cost of you know, switching from a traditional to an agile? Obviously, there is some cost involved. I mean, you need to get people trained, you know, change people's mindset, and that's going to cost money and effort as well. So how, how does the company kind of analyze you know, uh, in terms of costs and benefits, right? I mean, hmm. is it worth switching to agile or is it, uh, just staying with um, traditional, but adopt some of the agile practices and principles, you know? That's a great question. So this has really changed post COVID, honestly. Mm. Um, before COVID, I, I think we used to have to do a lot more convincing people, you know, hey, yeah. don't you use agile methods, right? Don't you think you should try to use agile, you know, right. uh, for delivery, you know, for your governance or whatever. But now teams are so distributed, they're digital, they have to keep adapting, they don't know what's coming next. Agile mm-hmm. is kind of like, an, it's like a no-brainer, we would say in the US, right? It's like, you okay. have to have that kind of adaptability, right? right? So now it's not really that hard of a sell. I think it's just mm-hmm. a question of organizations, well, how, how, how do we get there more than it is like, hey, should we do this, right? right. And a good example is point, like, yeah. yeah, the adaptability here in Singapore, where I'm based, um, I used to work in an organization. I remember they used to be like, hey, you know, we want to have people work remotely, have some adaptability and, you know, the way they work and have these adaptable type teams. And I remember pre, this is several years before COVID, they said, no way, you know, maybe one day a month, maybe you could do it. We don't, we don't think we could ever do that, right? Yeah. Now, obviously, like 30 to 50% of their staff is always remote and always in different locations, right? Right. Yeah. And they're always adapting their teams and they're always having to make these changes. So, COVID has really changed the game, I think, as far as agility. Most people I talk to who are in our space, they're actually doing more work post-COVID, not less, right? Okay. So there's a lot happening, and I think it's this less of a hard sell to tell people you need to have this agility, even though you're making your portfolio. Okay. Fine. Okay. Yeah. 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 I get it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the great great explanation. Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments on that or any other topics we talked about. Great. Well, you guys, thanks for sticking all the way through here. 
I know it's a late night time, so please, any feedback you guys have, um, if the time was okay for you, you know, let me know if, you know, if it was, if it was good, you can give it a yes. If it was maybe a little too late, you can comment there, say too late. So we got to kind of think we're going to do like the 6.30 Singapore time slot and a 9.30 time slot. Um, other than that, appreciate you guys coming out and look out for the information um, also on the, um, the meetup site for the upcoming class as well that I mentioned. And we appreciate you guys coming out. Okay, great. Thanks, Thanks, John. This was great. Fantastic, okay. John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.